Hi, it's Pastor Brian Mackey, pastor of the White Branch in Nettle Creek Church of the Brethren. Congratulations, you made it. This is the final week of the Foundations of Spiritual Maturity. And if you made it this far with me, I'm so glad. If you're just joining us for the very first one, that's great. Uh, this is the last one. So you can watch this one and then go back and see all the ones you missed. Or you can pause it right now and go back and try to watch the earlier ones. They do build on each other. Uh, but this is a very important one. As we close it out today, we're going to talk about eternal judgment. And uh, then we'll be have our foundation down. Um, and again, I want you to realize that uh, just because it's called the foundations of spiritual maturity doesn't mean that we lay them and forget them. Uh, my family and I have been going through some uh, Taekwondo, and um, we're moving up a little bit on the belts. And we don't go, we don't forget the earlier forms that we've worked on. We don't forget the things we've learned in the white belt. We just build on that, and we continue to work on those. And so I encourage you uh, to continue to work on the foundations as you move on to maturity. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we don't want to stay stuck on just the foundations. We want to be able to build on that. Uh, just like with the belts, you don't want to stay on white belt for the rest of your life. You want to be able to move on. Uh, but that doesn't mean you leave behind the foundations. It just means that you strengthen those, you keep them strong, and then you build on to that. So with that in mind, let's pray. God, we thank you for this opportunity again to study the foundations of spiritual maturity. I thank you for this journey. I thank you for what it's meant for me personally as I've gone back through these. And I pray now that you will bless this journey together. Help us to see what you want us to see and know you better and become the disciple, follower of you you want us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. So as usual, I'm going to put up the notes here for you, study notes. Now, I originally did this class uh, January 31st, the last day of January 2022. I don't know when you're going to be watching it. Um, but for those that were there, I gave them a bit of a final. <laughs> it was a fun final. I didn't grade it or anything. Uh, but just kind of a fun way to kick off our review. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and do that right now. We're going to go through each of these questions, and I'll answer them real quick. Before we start, though, I would encourage you to get a Bible, since this is a Bible study. And at any moment, you can pause, and you can look at some of these things in more detail. Or you can come back and join us in a little bit. So we will get into Hebrews 5 here in just a minute. But first, let's look at our review or the final. Okay. So number one, what is the title of this whole study? And that's on the first page. <laughs> foundations of spiritual maturity. The second question, what are the nine foundations? Ten if you separate the baptisms into two. List them in order if possible. Again, I've got those all up here. Uh, number one, the glory of God. Number two, the new birth. Number three, righteousness. And then the next six come straight out of Hebrews 6, 1 through 2. Repentance, faith, instruction about baptisms, water and the Spirit, laying out of hands, resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. So that's the first two questions there. We'll look some more at those in just a minute. Okay, and then the next question, what is our purpose to bring glory to God? Uh, the next one, what is the heart of sin? Seeking to take glory away from God. How many people are sinners? Everybody. The new birth is physical or spiritual. It's a spiritual new birth. It's not a physical new birth. Um, what is one purpose of the law? One purpose of the law is to show us our sin or show us that we are sinners, show us how we have fallen short. And then we are made righteous by believing four core aspects of the gospel or four core aspects of the good news. Number one, that Christ died as a just punishment or just payment for our sins. Number two, Christ was buried. Number three, Christ was resurrected. And number four, we received righteousness. Um, so that's the core aspects of the gospel, how we're made righteous. Number 10, what does repentance mean? It means turning away, or it means to have a transformative change, or it means to change your mind or change your mindset. Number 11, faith in God can be defined biblically by Hebrews 11.1. 1. You may have a different translation depending on what your translation says. Faith is being sure, NIV, or the assurance or the conviction of what we hope for. And uh, yours might say the evidence of what we do not see. Or uh, faith is being sure we hope for, being certain of what we do not see. The substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. It could be translated all those different ways. 
And then number 12 was definition of baptism, to immerse or submerse. Number 13, what two baptisms do I believe everyone should have? And technically it's three, uh, but let's start with the two. Uh, baptism in water and then baptism in the spirit. And then the third one is baptism into the body of Christ. So really all three of those. What are two types of supernatural speech? Uh, speaking in tongues and prophecy. And name four reasons to lay hands on others. Uh, one reason is to help them to receive healing. Another one is to help them to receive the baptism or the immersion in the Holy Spirit. Another one is to appoint leaders in the church. And a fourth one is to impart a spiritual gift or spiritual blessing into that person's life. So that leads us up to last week's, which was the resurrection of the dead. And re resurrection of Jesus is essential to Christianity. And then we also will resurrect when Jesus returns. Until then, believer spirits go to be with Jesus in heaven. So that was our final that I had everyone take uh, in person. And I did that for three reasons. Number one, because it was just fun. <laughs> I had fun watching people uh, working on this final exam and trying to get their answers down and seeing how they, how they approached it. Uh, they were very studious in their answers and responses. Did a great job. Of course, I review every week. If you've watched a lot of these videos, you probably think I reviewed too much, especially for video format, since you could anytime go back and watch them. The second reason was so that we could learn to become teachers, as Hebrews 5 says. And the third one was to prepare for our ultimate final exam, which is eternal judgment. So that's what we're heading toward today. So let's back up a minute. Let's go to Hebrews 5:11 through 6.3. This has been our key scripture through this whole study. Hebrews 5.11 through 6.3. It says, we have much to say about this, but it is hard to explain because you are slow to learn. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. So part of my reason for doing the reviews is to make sure that you could be a teacher, that you could articulate your faith to others. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to have the title of a teacher or have to lead a Sunday school class or a small group. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be a preacher um, or a pastor or an official minister. It just means that you should be able to teach these core truths to somebody else, whether it be your children, your grandchildren, your friend, somebody you're trying to help to know the Lord. We all on some level should be able to teach the core of our faith to other people, people that just inquire and ask us what we believe. We should be able to share these things. And so I reviewed and reviewed and reviewed so that each week we could say, this is what I believe and this is why I believe it. And you may not say it in the same way that I do. You may not use the depth, of course, that I do. Um, you may have your own understanding of some of these things that are a little different than how I presented it. But either way, I wanted you to be able to see that with enough time and focus and effort, you'd be able to teach that faith onto somebody else. And then uh, verse 13, anyone who lives on milk being still an infant is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. That's where my third foundation came from. The first was the glory of God. The second was the new birth. And the third, we started here in Hebrews, the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish or discern between good and evil. Therefore, let us leave the elementary teachings about Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again the foundation of, and this is the last six we've been doing, repentance from acts that lead to death, faith in God, instruction about baptisms, laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And God permitting, we will do so. So today we're going to talk about this eternal judgment, the ultimate final exam, I call it. It's the final destiny of all until Jesus returns, death and then the judgment. Let's go to Hebrews 9, 27 to see this now. Just a few chapters over, Hebrews 9, 27 says, just as man is destined to die once, and after that to face judgment. So it's the destiny of every human being on the planet to die once, and then to face the judgment. Now, if that's the destiny of every single person on the planet, then it would be really wise of us to prepare for this day to prepare for the day of our death, 
and prepare for the day of our judgment. Now, if you're like most people, you've taken a lot of tests in your life. If you went through K through 12 school, there was a lot of tests along the way. Tests for each subject or tests for each grade. You may have had national tests or standardized tests. You may have had entrance exam tests to get into college. You may have had tests to see if you get certified with a certain certification, uh, whether that be for driving, whether that be for another trade, or whether that be for some sort of profession. There's a lot of tests we take in our lives. And then those tests determine whether or not we pass or whether or not we move into a certain level of something that we want to achieve. So today I want to talk about the eternal judgment. And if we will prepare, if we will study, and if we will uh, get focused and put a lot of effort on passing tests that will give us something of a temporary value, like graduating school or getting a certification, how much more should we put the emphasis on an eternal test? A test that's going to decide our eternal destiny. A test that's going to decide where we go for the rest of our lives and what we do for the rest of our lives after we pass from here. I would encourage you, spend time preparing for that one. That's the most important one. And I kind of talked to the people that were in front of me on Monday and said, okay, uh, you know, we're not grading this today, and so we're just having some fun. But you will stand before God, specifically Jesus, for your final exam for the rest of your life. And I want to make sure that you are ready for that one. So take some time as we begin here today. Open your heart and listen. And I want you to be prepared as best as you can from this day forward for your eternal judgment. First, we're going to start in 2 Corinthians 4. And we're going to combine last week and this week. We're going to talk about uh, resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment and how they go together. So let's look at this in 2 Corinthians 4, 13 through 5, 10. 2 Corinthians 4, 13. It is written, I believed, therefore I have spoken. With that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak. Because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you in his presence. All this is for your benefit, so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Now we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling. Because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened, because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed our heavenly dwelling, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now it is God who has made us for this very purpose, and has given us the Spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Therefore, we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. We live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please Him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due Him for the things done in the body, whether good or bad. There's a lot of things I want to talk about here, so I'll back up into four a little bit, and then we'll move into five, and then we'll move on to our, our next point here. But in verse 14 of chapter 4, it says, We know the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead. Again, that's last week. We're talking about the insignificance of the resurrection. That without the resurrection, we don't have Christianity. We know the one who raised our Lord Jesus from the dead. And he will also raise us with Jesus. 
So when Jesus returns, we will resurrect. Jesus resurrected, we will too, in a glorified body. And all that brings glory to God, it says in verse 15. Therefore, 16, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we're wasting away. Outwardly, our body may be getting more and more uh, older or having more problems or maybe ailing or aching more. But inwardly, we're being renewed day by day. There's an inward and there's an outward. And inwardly, spiritually, we're being renewed day by day. And then look at what Paul says in verse 17, our light and momentary troubles. He calls the troubles that we go through now light and momentary. And a lot of times we don't think about them that way. When we're going through some difficult, hard things, we often don't feel like it's light. We often don't feel like it's momentary. And Paul went through a lot. Paul was beaten. Paul was rejected. Paul was shipwrecked. Paul went hungry. Paul struggled. He had people who rejected him, who were his friends and family members. He had people who rejected him, who were Gentiles. Paul had some difficulties he went through. And yet he had the perspective that those difficulties were light and they were momentary. Why? Because he knew there was something better. He knew there was something better coming and it was going to last a whole lot longer. He said, my few years of trouble here on the earth are nothing compared to the eternity compared to the eternal glory that far outweighs them all. I can suffer for a little while because I know something better is coming. It is light and it is momentary. Think about the idea of no pain, no gain, right? You're, you're going to have a little bit of pain with your workout or your exercise for a long-term gain. And I was, you know, when I think about this, I think about when I go to the dentist and I think, that's light and momentary pain <laughs> for something better coming. But the idea here is everything we go through is only short term. We got to think long term. And too often as people, we focus on the short term instead of the long term. Look at verse 18. We fix our eyes not on what is seen. That's the short term. But we fix our eyes on what is unseen. That's the long term. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. So where do you want to put more effort? To what's eternal or what's temporary? And then in 5, he compares our earthly body to a tent. Why? Because a tent is not meant to be permanent. A tent is meant to be temporary. A tent is meant to be able to move. People who were in nomadic cultures, for example, they built tents because they were not planning on staying there. They were planning on picking that tent up and moving it. In the Old Testament, when they built the tabernacle, the tabernacle was not meant to be a permanent structure in one location. It was meant to move. Even today, when we go camping and we put up a tent, we're not meant to stay there forever. It's meant to be a temporary place and then pick it up and move and go somewhere else. A lot of times when we go camping, even now, you think, oh, this is fun. I love camping. The tent's fun. But there comes a point when you're ready to get out of the tent. You don't want to stay in the tent forever. There comes a point when you're ready to go home. And Paul compares this here. He says, we have an eternal house or an eternal home in heaven, not built by human hands. We're groaning because of that. And then he talks about the idea of clothing. That like right now, we're kind of like naked. <laughs> but eventually, we're going to be clothed with our heavenly clothing. Verse 4, for while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened. And we eventually want what is mortal, this current body's mortal. We want that to be swallowed up by a body that's immortal, the resurrection body. So that's why verse 7 of chapter 5, we live by faith and not by sight. And that's why in verse 9, we make it our goal to please him. Our goal in life should be to please Jesus. Why? Because in verse 10, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ for our final exam, that each may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. We'll talk more about that judgment seat here in a minute. But first, I want you to recognize from Genesis 18, 25, when um, Abraham is pleading to the Lord on behalf of Sodom, asking for mercy for Sodom, he says, will not the judge of all the earth do right? And he's talking to God saying, you are the judge of all the earth. So he acknowledges, number one, that God is the judge of all the earth. And number two, he will do right. God will not judge wrongly. And there's two main ways God brings judgment. One is judgments in history. Judgments in history are meant to be short term. They are meant to be temporal and they do not decide eternity. We need to know that. Just because God judges something now does not mean that's the eternal judgment. 
But because God is active in all of life, not just the end, God does judge throughout history. The deist idea was that God created everything and left it alone. If we don't think God is actually making judgments in history, then we're saying God's not active in the world today. God doesn't care what happens until we get to the eternity of judgment. That is wrong. God does actively care and actively participate and actively judge. And to judge doesn't just mean negative. In fact, judge can be a positive thing because God's judgment is God's decision. It is God making a decision for or against. It's not just negative. The against side is negative. Sometimes when we hear judgment, we always think negative. It's God making a decision, which could be blessing, which could be a positive thing. But it also could be on the negative side or punishment. But that punishment could also be God's mercy in order to bring about repentance in that person's life or to bring a salvation from the eternal damnation or the eternal judgment. So sometimes God judges in history in order to save us from the judgment of eternity. If we'll respond the way that he wants us to during that historical judgment. God's judgment in history can be individual, as an individual person, or it could be for nations. Could be for individual believers, could be for Jewish people or the Jewish nation, could be the Gentile nations. You read throughout the Old Testament, God often brought judgments to the Jewish people as a whole, to the Gentile people, the Gentile nations, individual nations. You see throughout the prophets, God will call it individual nations and respond in judgment. We also see God responding to individuals like King David, King Saul, etc. So here's a question to consider. This is about the historical judgment. What is God doing in the world? What is God doing in America? What is God doing in our churches? What is God doing in your life individually in these last two years? Let's not just leave God out of the picture as if we live in a deist world. We don't. God is doing something in the world today. God is doing something in America today. God is doing something in our church today. God is doing something in your life today. What is it? I'm not going to give you the answer. I'm going to ask you to pray about that and consider that. But that's not my main point today. My main point today is not historical judgments. We're going to flip now and focus on the other side, eternal judgments. The historical judgments are temporary. The eternal judgments are not. So eternal judgments decide, number one, where we spend eternity. Will it be in heaven, in the new earth eventually? Revelation 21, 1 through 4. With God, with Jesus, with other believers, and without the curse of sin. It's with the things we want and without the things we don't want. With God, with Jesus, with other believers, without the curse of sin. That's where we will spend eternity, and that's based on whether we trust in Jesus as Lord or reject Jesus as Lord. Hell, then, is the opposite for rejecting Jesus as Lord. It's without the good things and with the bad things. So it's without God, and it's with Satan, with demons, It's a place of God's wrath and punishment. And the Bible describes it as a place of loneliness, a place of darkness, a place of fire, a place of weeping, a place of gnashing of teeth. More images like that. It is not good. It's an eternal judgment. But then the next part of eternal judgments will decide what and how we will spend eternity. Not just where. What will you do in eternity? What role will you have? What rewards will you have? So we're going to focus on uh, number two today, the eternal judgments, not number one, the historical judgments. Just know that God's involved in both, and God's the judge of both. So now to John 5, Jesus gives, Jesus is given by the Father authority to judge. Go to John chapter 5, and Jesus here is speaking to some of the people that were judging him. And Jesus responds to them in John 5, 19. I tell you the truth, the son can do nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees his father doing. Because whatever the father does, the son also does. Now verse 20. For the father loves the son and shows him all he does. Yes, to your amazement, he will show him even greater things than these. 21. For just as the father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the son gives life to whom he is pleased to give it. 
22, the father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the son. I want you to see that one line right there. The father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the son. Now, when we stand before God for our eternal judgment, who will be our judge? The father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the son. The son, Jesus, will be our judge. Now, we like to talk about Jesus as Savior. We like to talk about Jesus as love. Talk about Jesus as mercy. Talk about Jesus as grace. Talk about Jesus as even Lord. And he is all those things, but he is also judge. If you want to give Jesus a title, along with everything I just said, you can add Messiah, you can add King. He is also judge. Verse 23 that all the purpose now the Father gives all judgment to the Son is so that all may honor the Son, just as they honor the Father. In other words, God's saying, I want you to honor my Son as if you would honor me. And that's why I'm giving him all the judgment. And this is the Trinitarian view of God. Not that the Son is less than the Father, but that all three are co-equally God. All three are, are united as one. But there is a distinction between Father and Son and Holy Spirit. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. And he's speaking now to a largely Jewish audience who thought they were honoring the Father. But then Jesus was correcting them and said, You're not actually honoring the Father unless you honor me as the Son. 24, I tell you the truth. Whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned, praise God. So we will not be condemned for eternity. We will have no condemnation in our eternal judgment if we have the Son. We've crossed from death to life. I tell you the truth, Jesus says, a time is coming and has now come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. Verse 26, For as the Father has life in himself, so he granted the Son to have life in himself, and he has given him authority to judge because he is the Son of Man. Verse 27. Jesus has been given authority to judge. Verse 28. Do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice. 29. And come out. Those who have done good will rise to live. Those who have done evil will rise to be condemned. Verse 30. By myself I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear. So the Father and Son are working together in judgment. And my judgments are just. My judgments are righteous. For I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. So even though the Son's the one judging, he's going to judge according to the Father, and the Father's going to be working through the Son for judgment. It's, it's united. But ultimately, he says here, the Son is the judge, and the Son has the authority to judge. So back in 2 Corinthians 5.10 now, it talks about we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ to receive what has been done in the body, whether good or bad. Again, I'll turn there, 2 Corinthians 5.10, so we can all be seeing this. 2 Corinthians 5.10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. This idea of the judgment seat comes from the Greek word bima or bema. Okay, it means a raised platform. This raised platform idea could be used for public speaking. It also can be used in a court of law for a judge to decide decisions. And in this context, we're looking at the decisions. Now, the brethren, for example, in our, in our preaching in the early days, we opposed the use of a bema or bema. We opposed the use of a raised platform because we wanted the ministers to be on the same level as uh, the congregation, that they weren't elevated, that they weren't more important or closer to God. Uh, that was the priesthood of all believers. But Church of England, Presbyterians, others have a very raised platform. Um, and that's where they preach from and teach from. Another uh, analogy or thing to think about is 1 Corinthians 9, 24 and 25, 2 Timothy 2, 5. Talk about a raised platform for receiving the victor's crown. Uh, we're into Winter Olympics again. 
So whenever it's the Olympics, you have the raised platform for first and second and third. They're raised above. The victor is the highest, and he's on the bema or the bema, the raised platform, to receive his crown, his victory. Now we'll get into Romans 14 here. But first, I, before I get into Romans 14, I want you to see this. There's two categories of all actions. It says whether good or bad. So all categories are going to be good or bad. Everything that you've done in life is good or bad. There's no middle ground. You've either done good or you've done bad. At the judgment seat, we're going to be all individually standing before God. For things done while in this body, good or bad, and this is not for condemnation if you're true believers, because if you're a true believer, you're already made righteous, as John 5 said. You will not be condemned at the judgment seat of Christ if you're already righteous. And this is to show us what our service is going to be into eternity. So Romans 14, this is in the context of eating meat sacrificed to idols or not eating meat sacrificed to idols. And Romans 14 10 says you then why do you judge your brother or why do you look down on your brother for we will all stand before God's judgment seat it is written as surely as I live says the Lord every knee will bow before me every tongue will confess to God so then each of us will give an account of himself to God each of us will give an account of himself to God so there's disputable matters in the Bible, and that's things like eating meat sacrificed to idols. Idolatry itself is not a disputable matter. We are not to be idolaters. And when we are, we are wrong, and we need to repent of that. But if the meat itself was sacrificed to an idol, and you're not actually participating in idolatry, it's a disputable matter. Some think it's wrong, some think it's okay. And Paul says, don't judge each other around that. Just do what you think is right. And don't put a stumbling block in the way of your brother or sister. You will give an account for yourself, for your own actions, for your own decisions on that. So we'll be judged, but we'll not be condemned. If we are believers, I want you to hear this. We'll be judged, but we'll not be condemned. Okay? So if we're judged, but we're not condemned, then what, what is happening? What are we judged for? How does this look like? The best thing, I think, that shows us how this works is 1 Corinthians chapter 3. So let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and we'll talk a little bit about this. And when we do, I think some things will become a little more clear. So 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10 says, By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as an expert builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one should be careful how he builds. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. I believe that's our salvation. We are saved by Jesus and what he did for us. We are saved by grace and through faith. If we have the foundation of Jesus Christ in our life, we will not be condemned. Now, verse 12. If any man builds on the foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, his work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light. I believe this is our judgment. How did we build on the foundation of Jesus that we got in our life? It will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. Quality of the work, not the quality of the faith. If what he has built survives, he will receive his reward, our eternal reward. And I believe the judgment seat of Christ for believers is to determine our eternal reward. If, he, if it is burned up, he will suffer loss. So there are things that we can do in our Christian life that are not godly, they are not good, they are disobedient, or maybe they are godly, but they are done for the wrong motive, for the wrong reason, the wrong heart, the wrong attitude. I believe those things will get burned up in the fire. The things that will remain are the things that we did by the grace of God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, with the right heart, with the right attitude, with the right motive. We are basically fulfilling the calling that God had for us. God called us. We obeyed, we fulfilled the call, we produced fruit, and the fruit that we produce will remain. The things that we did that were not in the will of God for our lives, or were sinful or disobedient, or we obeyed the call but for the wrong reasons, with the wrong motives, and we didn't produce fruit that he wanted, I believe that's going to be burned up. Verse 15, if it is burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved. 
See, it's not that we're going to be eternally condemned. We'll be eternally saved. But only as one escaping through the flames. <laughs> like the joke that if you see someone coming into heaven with some smoke on them, they barely made it. <laughs> I don't think we'll literally see the smoke on them. But what I'm th saying here is this imagery here, and whether it's imagery or actual fire, I'm not sure how it's all going to work in eternity. But there is a judgment on the decisions that we made, on the actions that we took, while done in the body as believers. But those actions is not what's going to determine whether we go to heaven or don't go to heaven. We will go to heaven based on our faith and what Jesus did for us, not what we did for him. And then all the actions that we took will be judged by Christ as good or bad. All the actions we took that were bad will be burned up and eliminated forever. All the actions we took that are good will be rewarded. And that will put us in a decision of what we will do for eternity, how we will spend eternity, what rewards we will have in eternity. So fire will test our work. If it endures, then we will receive reward. If it is burned, we will suffer loss, but we will be saved as one escaping the fire. Now I want to admit here, the Catholic idea of purgatory may fit this description. However, and I want to say however, personally, I do not see what's described here as being a place. Like you go to heaven or you go to hell or you go to purgatory. And this is all going on while you're in purgatory. I don't see that. I also don't see this as a long process. Like many, many, many years to get purged. But I do want to admit that this does look like a purging, which is what purgatory means. It means a purging. This does look like a purging of the things that are impure or removing of all that is unclean in our lives. Now, the Catholic's understanding is that this goes into our actual soul and, you know, all the sins and everything need to be purged and purified from our lives before we're fit for going into heaven. What I see here is that our works, while done in the body, whether good or bad, are going to be judged. And it's going to be a pretty quick process. And during that judgment, they're either judged good or bad. And the things that are bad go away. The things that are good remain. And we go on into eternity with our reward. So I don't believe we need to pray for the souls in purgatory or do different things to try to help them. I believe that there is a process of purification for the works that we did. But that's quick. And we move into eternity. Uh, it's not necessarily a place. It all takes place at the judgment seat of Christ. Revelation 21, 27 just talks about nothing impure, unclean entering into eternity. So what's our motive for what we do? Is it for God's glory or for our own glory? Was it for selfish ambition or pride? Was it to obedience to God's word or obedience to self? And if it was for our own glory, for our own selfish ambition, for our own pride, then those things will be burned and removed. But if it was for God's glory, which is our first point today, then that's the purpose of everything. If it was for God's glory, it'll be rewarded and blessed. So now we're going to look at a pretty challenging parable, the parable of the talents, Matthew 25, 14 to 30. It's especially challenging after what I just said in some ways. So Matthew 25, Jesus talks about three parables, actually. This is one of the three. We're not going to look at all three. You know, the parable of the virgins with the oil, the parable of the talents, and then the parable of the sheep and the goats. 25, 14. And I'm going to summarize a little bit here as we go. So there's a man going on a journey, and he called his servants together. He gave one man five talents, another he gave two talents, another he gave one talent. Now, a talent we think of as ability because of this parable, actually. But a talent was a uh, amount of money, okay? So you could say something like he gave one $50, he gave another $10, he gave another $1, all right? That's what we would think of today with our money. We don't think of talent as money. But talent was a measurement of money. But the reason he gave them those was according to their ability. So if you had a lot of ability, he gave $50. If you had middle ability, he gave you $10. You didn't have very much ability, he gave you $1. After a long time, he came back and he settled accounts with them. And the one who had five gained five more. The one who had two gained two more. Or if you had $50, you got 50 more. $10, you got 10 more. And then he said to them, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. 
Come and share your master's happiness. And I believe this is how we'll be rewarded in eternity. In the new heaven and the new earth that we get. That if we were faithful with what God gave us to do here in this life, that in eternity, God will give us more responsibility and more things to be uh, doing. We'll have a higher level of things that we will be doing in eternity. But then he had another, and the one with only one talent, said, I knew you were a hard man. This is now Matthew 25, 24. Harvesting where you have not uh, sown, gathering where you have not scattered seeds. I was afraid. I went out and I hid your talent in the ground. So he took it back out and said, here's what belongs to you. He gave the talent back. He didn't use it. He didn't use what the master gave him. So his master said in verse 26, you wicked, lazy servant. Notice wickedness and laziness goes together for Jesus. He wants us to use what he's given us to honor and glorify him. Use what he's given us to produce fruit. Use what he's given us to do something. And he said, so you already knew that I was going to do this. Well then, verse 27, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would receive it back with interest. You could have at least partnered with somebody else. You could have at least given it to somebody else who would use it and you get something out of it. Financially, for example, if God's given you money, you can give that to another ministry who can produce and then you can help partake of the reward because you helped what they were doing. Or you don't have much talent for yourself, maybe you can say, how can I serve the church? How can I serve a ministry? How can I at least do something to help? Can I set up chairs? Can I wash dishes? Can I hand out flyers? Can I like, comment, and share this post? Can I help do something? Maybe I'm not the one who can articulate my faith very well, but I find someone who can, and I like what they're saying, and I share that with other people. Maybe I can't really do that, but I'm going to give somebody a book. Find a way to do something with what God's given you. So he says, take the talent from him and give it to the one who has 10 talents, 29. For everyone who has will be given more, and he'll have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has, will be taken away from him. Now, that's hard enough to hear, especially in our modern Western culture. You're going to take it away from the one who has one, and now he's going to have zero, and you're going to give it to the one who already has 10? Does he really need more? Now we go to verse 30. This is the hardest line, though. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now that's hard for me to hear, especially in my understanding of salvation. That's by grace and through faith, what Jesus did for us, not what we do for him. So was this person a true believer? I would argue this person was not a true believer, but had the opportunity to. That they had the call that they may have been in the church. They may have seen the other believers around them. They may have known what God wanted, but chose to do nothing. They maybe just attended church, but they never had a heart change and they never served the Lord. That's about the best I can do for you there. Um, but the bottom line here in these three parables, if you look at the virgins who didn't bring enough oil, the one talent servant and the uh, goats and the sheep, they all did nothing, and they got rejected by Jesus. Same thing with the parable of the minas. I'm not going to read that one for you today, but you can read it on your own if you'd like. It's similar, but they all start with one talent instead of different levels. And again, the one who had nothing did nothing, and he said you should have found some way to produce some interest and produce some fruit. So now we're getting to our... Final page here. I've got a few more things I want to talk about, though. Let's look at a case study from 1 Corinthians 11. 1 Corinthians 11. I spent a lot of time looking at this scripture specifically when I did my doctoral work on Love Feast. But today I want to look at it in light of judgment. There's a lot of different ways we could look at this. But I want to look at it in light of judgment. So 1 Corinthians 11, 
talks about when they were coming together for the Lord's Supper, they were actually getting judged for the way they were doing the Lord's Supper. Verse 27, it says, Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in unworthy manner, and some versions say unworthily, and um, I think too often people thought of themselves as whether they were worthy or not to partake of the Lord's Supper. Is my behavior worthy enough? Am I a worthy enough participant to receive the Lord's Supper? And if we think about it that way, none of us is worthy enough to receive the Lord's Supper. Uh, Jesus alone is worthy enough, but he makes us worthy by his blood, which is what we're celebrating in the Lord's Supper. So by partaking in the Lord's Supper, we're actually saying, thank you for making me worthy to receive this. So we really shouldn't look at uh, our own life and say, am I a worthy participant? But is the way that I'm doing the Lord's Supper worthy of Jesus? That's what we need to ask ourselves. If you're doing the Lord's Supper in a way that is not honoring to Jesus, then it says we'll be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. 28 then, a man ought to examine himself before he eats the bread and drinks the cup. Not to see if I'm worthy, but to see if I'm going to partake in a manner that's worthy of him. Now 29, for anybody who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. So how do you get judged in the Lord's Supper? By eating and drinking without recognizing the body of the Lord. Talk about a little bit more about what that might mean in a minute here. 30, that is why many among you, now here's the judgment. What's the judgment? What are they receiving? Many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep or died. But if we judged ourselves, we would not come under judgment. Now, 32, I really want you to see this, because I think this one makes the difference here between a temporary historical judgment versus an eternal judgment. 32, when we are being judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that the result, we will not be condemned with the world. The goal is that we would not be condemned with the world. So we're receiving temporary judgment to repent. Temporary judgment to change. Temporary judgment to be spared from the eternal judgment. So these are true believers, I believe, who are being temporarily judged by the way they are taking the Lord's Supper, not because they themselves aren't worthy, but because the way they're taking the Lord's Supper is not worthy of him. And that's resulting in judgment. And people are getting weak, people are getting sick, and some are dying, and he used the word fall asleep. If you watched my last week's teaching, I encourage you to do so. One thing I said about the Apostle Paul and Jesus both. They used the term fallen asleep to refer to believers who had died. Why? Because falling asleep means you will eventually wake up. Death meant the end, or death meant those who were away from the Lord, those who would experience eternal condemnation. Falling asleep means that your death of the body is temporary, your spirit is still alive, and your body will come back and wake up when Jesus returns. So I believe because he says some of you have fallen asleep, he means their body has died, but their spirit is with Jesus, and they will come back to life when Jesus returns, even though they are partaking of the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. It's a serious, serious sin, but not serious enough, or nothing, let's put it this way, can overcome the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus is still more powerful than serious sin. So we cannot be condemned with the world when we're being judged as believers. But temporarily, we might experience judgment, weakness, sickness, even physical death. So then, 33, he says, when you come together to eat, wait for each other. If anyone is hungry, he should eat at home so that when you meet together, it may not result in judgment. In other words, I don't want you to have be judged when you do the Lord's Supper. So let's change how we're doing the Lord's Supper. First of all, eat at home. What does this mean? My understanding of this scripture is it's in the context of a full meal. That's why I talk about the love feast. It's not in the context of one piece of bread and one little cup. Because that one piece of bread and that one little cup is not what they're talking about here. Let's go back a little bit in 11. Verse 17. Put this all together. In the following directives, I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. So this 
way of celebrating the Lord's Supper does more harm for them than good for them. 18, in the first place, I hear that when you come together to church, there are divisions among you. So there are divided church, and that's a lot of what 1 Corinthians is talking about, being a divided church. And these divisions have led into the divisions that have carried over into their way of participating in the Lord's Supper. And their way of participating in the Lord's Supper is divided in a negative way. And let's remember the body of Christ, yes, refers to the bread that you're partaking in, but also refers to the people because 1 Corinthians 12, the very next chapter, says we are the body of Christ. And we are all part of it. We're all members individually of the body of Christ. So we have to honor the body of Christ, meaning not just the bread, but also the people who make up the body of Christ. And when we dishonor the people of the body of Christ, when we come together as the body of Christ, that's resulting in judgment. It's doing more harm than good. Look at verse 19. No doubt there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. When you come together, the way that you're doing this, it's not the Lord's Supper you eat. Verse 21. Because how are they doing it? Each of you goes ahead without waiting for anyone else. One remains hungry and they don't get any food. Another gets drunk. They eat, drink so much that they get drunk. This tells me it's not unfermented grape juice like Welch's. This tells me this is real wine at this real meal, and they are partaking together. And some people are drinking so much of the wine, they're getting drunk, and some people aren't even getting any food. So this, 22, he says, don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Do you despise the church of God? Do you humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say? Shall I praise you for this? Certainly not. This is not a way to honor Jesus in his supper. And then he goes on to talk about the words of institution, what he received from the Lord. Do this in remembrance of me. Now 27, therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. So examine yourself, because 29, anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord, eats and drinks judgment on himself. And that is why you're receiving judgment. So he says, when you come together to eat, wait for each other. Don't be drunk before someone else gets a chance to even eat. Don't be that divided. You are going to be united as the body of Christ. So if you're hungry, just eat at home. So that when you come together, it's not going to result in judgment. Point being, there's a lot more I could say about that. But point being, there was a temporary judgment on those who were partaking in the Lord's Supper wrongly. So they would quit dishonoring the Lord's Supper as a body. But they themselves were still saved from the eternal judgment. That's how amazing God's judgment is and how merciful his judgment is. Even in something so serious as that, he would still say, You're forgiven because of the blood of Jesus. And they still would have been worthy to come to the table because Jesus made them worthy if they would have changed how they approached the table. Now, one more last thing I want to spend some time on, the great white throne. I always think of the great white shark here. <laughs> great white throne, Revelation 20, 11 through 15. So the judgment seat of Christ, I want you to see my point on that, is that it's for believers, not unbelievers. It's for those who already believe, and it's for those to find out which part of their works will endure and which part of their works will be removed and what rewards they will receive and what roles they will have when they enter into eternity. But this judgment, the great white throne judgment, is the eternal judgment for those to test whether or not they get to go to heaven. And these will be unbelievers standing before the throne. So you look at Revelation 20, 11, Then I saw a great white throne. And him who was seated on it, earth and sky fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. So for all those things that they did wrong, 
They are going to be judged for for eternity. This is unbelievers now. The sea gave up the dead that were in it. Now, some of this is imagery from earlier in Revelation, but it talks about the sea earlier in Revelation. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. So I believe this is people who are unbelievers, and their spirits went to Hades or hell, and now they get resurrected, as John talks about, the righteous and the unrighteous, to stand before God in judgment. And this is their last chance to stand before God in judgment. And I believe this is why it says, Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I believe this is where all the unbelievers now stand before God and confess, Jesus, you are Lord. Jesus, you are God. Even though they wouldn't do it willingly. And each person was judged according to what he had done. And for them, nothing is judged good. Why? This is where I want to bring everything back. I didn't do as good a job of this Monday in Bible study. But let me, let me finish this scripture, then we'll go back and talk about why. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. You see, that's the second death. So they had their first death before this. Then they get resurrected. They stand before Jesus again for their final judgment, where they will confess him as Lord, even though they don't want to. And now they will enter into a second death. Verse 15, if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, in other words, they weren't saved by grace through faith. They didn't acknowledge Jesus as Lord while they were alive. He was thrown into the lake of fire. And that's the eternal hell or the eternal final judgment that they will enter into. So, why, again, are none of their works considered good? Let's go back to the early, early part of this study. So, the purpose of everything. What is the purpose of everything? To give glory to God. To give glory to Jesus. To honor the Son. If everything you do in life is not to glorify God, not to give glory to Jesus, then guess what? Everything you do then is judged to be sinful. I know in our modern Western world this is so hard to comprehend. And I've talked about this several times because we think more about what we've done to another person than what we've done to God. We think as long as I've done good for other people, I was nice to people, I helped people, I didn't kill people, then we think that we're pretty righteous. But God flips that around and says, that's good, but that's second. What's most important was, to, was it to glorify God? Did you honor your creator? Did you give me Thanks. Did you honor me? Did you live life for me? And if not, you were seeking for your own glory, for the glory of created things, which Roman talks about. And when you've done that, you've actually become sinful. And that's the heart of sin, which is seeking to take glory away from God. No matter how good you think your works are, you sought to take glory away from God. And you stand before God now being judged for everything you've ever done, which was not to God's glory. And you didn't get that new birth. And that one purpose of the law will be to show you you're a sinner. And you never received the righteousness by grace and through faith. So you'll end life before God, not living for his glory, seeking to take glory away from him, and going through the commandments. And God will show you how many of those commandments you failed. How many of those commandments you went against him on and you rejected him, and you didn't want to receive him as Lord, and Jesus then will say it's time for the second death. Because only those who received my righteousness by grace and through faith can enter in. And so that's the difference. And that's why I say prepare yourself. Be ready for that final exam. Be ready for that final judgment, because it is destined, as Hebrews 9 talks about, for all of us to die. And then, the judgment. So my conclusion here, regardless of whether it's before the great white throne, as every human being on the planet will stand before, 
unless you were at the judgment seat of Christ, which is every believer, every person, including believers and unbelievers, will stand before God in judgment, specifically Jesus. Believers will not be condemned, and unbelievers will be eternally condemned. These are the two options for every person who's ever lived. Believers will enter into eternity with God, where all sin and wrongdoing will be gone, including what's been done from wrong motives. Instead, what remains will be righteousness and rewards and new assignments and roles for eternity. This is why I encourage you, think long term. How many years do we have here? Not very many. 90, 100, 120 at the most. Many of us won't make it that far. How many years do we have in eternity? This is light and momentary. This is temporary compared to eternity. I'm encouraging you to make decisions for the glory of God. Make decisions for your neighbor's good. Live to honor God. Live to serve your neighbor with eternity in mind. So my final question is for you. Number one, are you ready for your eternal judgment? Have you trusted in Jesus as your Lord and your Savior to take away all your sin, past, present, and future? So you can be judged righteous. You can be rewarded and given roles for eternity. If you want to talk to me about this, I'm happy to talk with you about this. And if you want to pray, I'm happy to pray with you. You can email me, pastor at whitebranchcob, as in boy, dot org. Uh, and I'm happy to connect with you. I want you to prayerfully consider your life's decisions in light of eternity. What do you want to change about your actions and or your motives? Finally, number three, um, if you know me, <laughs> or if you just want to write me again, pastor at whitebranchcob.org, what is something you have benefited from in this study? If you're watching this on Facebook or you're watching this on YouTube, you can put it in the comments. And just say, this is how this study uh, helped me in my understanding and my relationship with God. Uh, I know it's benefited me. I've loved this journey. It's really helped me uh, to go ahead and remind myself of the foundations, to remind myself of what I believe, and to remind myself of what's important to me and kind of find some of those cracks that were in my foundations and make some of those foundations stronger. I by no means claim to be spiritually mature. I feel like I've got a long way to go in my journey towards spiritual maturity. But this has helped me go back again to the foundations. So I really appreciate this study because it helped me a lot. Uh, for any of you, I'm glad that it helped you as well and helped you along the way in your journey. And um, thank you so much for doing this. Looking forward to the next stage, which we'll, we're going to take about a month off here now. And then in March during Lent, uh, we're going to do some Bible studies at White Branch Church of the Brethren. I'll plan a recording again when we get into that time. And we're going to move on to the next step. We're going to try to go past the foundations and go on to maturity. And we're going to talk about spiritual practices to help us spiritually grow in uh, March leading up to Easter. Easter Sunday is April 17th. Uh, put that on the calendar. Save the date. And if you're local and you want to come join us at White Branch or Nettle Creek Sunday, April 17th, I'm happy to have you. And we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. God bless you.